uh, approximately 645 on December 20th, 2022. This meeting of the Hingham Select Board is called to order. I'm gonna note for the record I am conducting uh, this, I'm sorry, this meeting is being held, uh, offered remotely as an alternate means of public access, pursuant to chapter 107 of the Acts of 2022 and all other applicable laws temporarily amending certain provisions of the open meeting law. You are hereby advised that this meeting and all communications during this meeting may be recorded by the town of Hingham in accordance with the open meeting law. If any participant wishes to record this meeting, please notify the chair at the start of the meeting in accordance with Mass General Law, Chapter 30A, Section 20F, so that the chair may inform all other participants of said recording. If anybody is recording this meeting, please notify me at this time. Seeing none, I note for the record participating in tonight's meeting are myself, William Ramsey Chair, uh, Board Member Liz Klein, and Board Member Joe Fisher. Next item on the agenda is the Pledge of Allegiance. For those willing, please stand and face the flag of our nation. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Next item on the agenda is the approval of minutes, but I think we're gonna hold the minutes uh, for our next meeting. Okay. Then we'll move to agenda item four, is to consider approval of a special one-day wine and malt beverages license to WM Brewing Company Incorporated for the New Year's bonfire to be held on Saturday, January 7th, 2023, with a rain date of Sunday, January 8th, 2023, from 5 p.m. to 8 p.m., I think Ann, Ann Smith White is going to present on behalf of the applicant this morning. Do we see Ann on the call? Not yet. I do not see her. All right, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to just hold this item in, a, in abeyance. We'll move to item five, which is to consider the approval of a special one day wine and malt beverages license to the Friends of Hingham Cemetery Incorporated for a night of music with Chelsea Berry and Matt. Cusson to be held at Ames Chapel on January 7th, 2023, from 7 p.m. to 10 p.m. I believe uh, John Davenport is going to present for the um, for the applicant. And we are 0 for 2 on the one days. <laughs> All right, so we're gonna we're not gonna delay the meeting, so we'll move to the budget, uh, the FY24 department budget request. The first um, item under this agenda. Uh, item is public works transfer station and sewer we have randy sylvester with us randy come on up here and welcome to join us good evening to you randy good to see you good to see you go ahead you may proceed Great. So the Public Works has six divisions, engineering, fleet maintenance, highway, sewer, transfer station, and tree and park. Um, that makes up the DPW. Um, some of the benchmarks and metrics that we have, uh, we have 140 miles of public roads, 100 mile, miles of drain lines, 60 miles of sidewalks, uh, over 10,000 drainage structures, over 10,000 public shade trees. Um, we do, <clears throat> and this is down in recent years, but our average of plantings per year were about 80. Um, we do about 380 removals a year. Uh, in 2021, that was much more since the storm. Um, and um, we do about 3,300 prunings. We have 80 pieces of snow removal equipment, uh, 3,100 traffic and street signs, and five sets of signals that we take care of. Um, <clears throat> the transfer station, that's operating four days a week, um, and we get over 8,000. It's more like 9,000 today. It does fluctuate, but it's, it's 85, 9,000 vehicles a, a week, which is up. And as far as the sewer system, we have 13 different pump stations throughout Weir River, that has one, and then North Sewer District, which is the downtown area, and that part of Hingham, that has 12. 
Our key initiatives as a DPW is the road construction program and utility coordination. And what I mean by that is we get a hold of the utilities and ask them if there's any main replacements or any um, infrastructure improvements that had to be had. <clears throat> and we'll notify them at least five years in advance that we're going to be doing a road and hopefully they get all their work done. Um, we also would have storm response and recovery. Uh, again, I mentioned the storm on 21 October. Um, that was a sign of how we go about things and we go out there and force and take care of it. Um, <clears throat> one of the, another key initiative is the MS4 uh, stormwater permit compliance. Um, and every year the, the, um, the, what's the word I want? Um, mandate. Hmm? Mandate. The, well, yeah, it is a mandate, but there's more mandates every year. Uh, um, the requirements go up and we have to hire engineering firms to go out and, and take care of that. Um, there's a public education um, part of it. Um, <clears throat> is, there's several different parts of the stormwater program. Um, we also put in for DEP grants, um, applications. Um, we receive approximately 15,000 or more a year just for our recycling program, and that's called the RDP um, program, Recycling Dividend um, Program, and we'll get money to put towards recycling. Um, <clears throat> we also do public education about the recycling, uh, recy recycling reg regulation changes, which recently there has been um, two. One is that mattress, um, well really one, mattress, Recycling is now mandatory. <clears throat> um, another, another initiative as far as the sewer department is the sewer, sewer INI program or sewer inflow and infiltration program, which we go out and <clears throat> camera the lines in the system and we repair any defects, keeping any outside water from infiltrating into the pipes, causing the, the, uh, the water that we have to pump and we have to pay either the MWRA through the North Hingham Sewer District or the town of Hull for Ware River. <clears throat> um, we also, another key in this initiative is the grounds maintenance of all the public's facilities. Um, that was really apparent this year where all the fields we had to have mowed on a regular basis, even though we're short down, short and down personnel. Um, we did uh, an excellent job and we got out there and mow mowed every field um, prior to any games or practices happening. Um, <clears throat> and then and the last one is a transfer station anal uh, fee analysis, which is basically ongoing, which we're analyzing the, the fee structures of surrounding towns and see how that may apply to Hingham. Um, in the DPW, well, in the, yeah, in the D DPW, we have full t 52 full-time positions, three-time part position, uh, three part-time positions. Um, and as far as the budgets go, DPW budget has a total of this year's $4,497,471. Um, $600,000 ,286 is for snow removal and $387,000 is for road maintenance. Uh, the transfer station budget total is 1,000, I mean 1, 1,845,987, ,000, and the sewer budget is $3,619,576. Um, <clears throat> I did put in an additional request this year um, for an assistant town engineer um, the town engineer, J.R. Fry, is pretty much straight out, and he has many, many projects to um, oversee, and um, those include um, road construction and paving projects, uh, the Route 3A design, public safety facility, um, the traffic committee, the Harbor Wharf wall resiliency project, pedestrian improvements and grants, and there's, and there's few more 
responsibilities other than that. Um, I do say that he's, he's doing a great job, but he does need the help and we could use the, the additional person in that division. And that's about it. If you have any specific questions, I'll be happy to answer them. Randy, thank you. Uh, just a couple, couple of questions and comments. Um, first of all, thanks for, thanks for all you're doing, your hard work. We're, we're lucky to have you uh, <coughs> as the superintendent. really appreciate all you do, and um, thank you for that. Sure. Um, you mentioned the field's work. You know, we had the rec department in here last week, and just a lot of compliments on the work, the, the condition of the fields, <coughs> uh, you, you know, your department's attention to cutting the fields, especially, you know, in the in the late summer and the fall when, when sports are going on and at kind of a high level and the games are happening. So thank you for that. That's been a, that's been a pretty successful venture for us, and uh, thanks for your supporting that. Um, <coughs> you mentioned uh, the, the uptick in um, the transfer station. Now, I know the uptick, we saw an uptick during COVID, which obviously was because people were home more. Mm -hmm. People were working remotely, so there was a higher use of the transfer station. People were easily going probably Thursdays being remote, Saturdays and Sundays being remote. And you, you, you said that that increase has stayed constant since? We're about, we're about 9,000 uh, cars a week. Hmm. Yes, or 8,000. 8,000 plus, I should say. Do you remember what it was before the pandemic? It was pandemic? about 7,000. 7, it was about seven, so it's increased cars. that much. Yeah. Wow, that's, that's, that's <coughs> significant. Um, so along those lines, I, I do think, I do see residents doing a good job recycling. And, you know, I, you know, my family and I were big into recycling and we have, you know, a bin for the plastic, bin for the paper. But, you know, I, I, it's not lost on me just how much plastic we see in there, mm -hmm. how much cardboard we see in there. A couple of years ago, um, I remember speaking with Steve Messenger and he told me that, you know, at one, there was a point in time when the town was actually making a profit on recycling items, but he said that there was, that was diminishing. Are we still, are we losing money now on recycling, or where are we with that process? Uh, well, we're not making money. Hmm. Um, there are a few um, commodities that we're still getting paid for, even though the market has dropped considerably. We were, uh, and one of those items is, is cardboard. We do bail the cardboard, we get paid per ton. Um, there is now a shipping fee where there was no shipping fees before. So every time we have to ship something, it's $100 or better. Um, the cardboard, basically uh, eight months ago, we were getting over $200 a ton. And now I looked at recently, it's um, $30, $30, $35 a ton. So it's all market demand and all the other recyclables Basically, I'm paying to get rid of plus the shipping. It's mm. good to know. Um, I am on that note. <clears throat> we have installed a baler. We did buy the baler through the RDP program, the Recycling Dividend Program. Um, it's been a long time coming, um, but it is ready to start. We just have to go through the startup process, and that way we can pick out the the um, the plastics and other commodities and bail them separately for a higher um, higher um, price when we go to sell it. So there are some um, uh, commodities out there that are up into the hundreds of dollars. Right now we bail it all together and we don't get that. We still have to pay. But what I want to do is bail those one commodities together and sell that separately and, and get it the, per the ton price. <clears throat> I agree with you about this assistant engineer position. You know, JR is doing quite a bit here, and I do think that's an additional request that we need to really push for. Uh, it's needed. Um, I also don't think we've really addressed your capital needs in the last couple of years, and I know that you have them, and we're, tr we're trying to figure out a solution maybe this year to, to increase our capital budget. How are you with capital needs? Um, especially with plowers, <clears throat> things like that, that, that the community really relies on? So the vehicles, my equipment that has to be replaced right now, like I put in for 10 things last year and got one, which is the loader, which is appreciated. We needed a, a loader, a Volvo loader. Um, but we haven't replaced any six-wheel big dump trucks for um, two years. And if it's... It will go on to three. 
Now we did replace one, one every year um, just to keep those up and they take a beating. They, they work all through the snow and they're getting salt. They might not have a lot of miles but they're starting to rot within. Um, <clears throat> and in the, in, the, in the summer, it, they're uti utilized on roadside and in the paving projects. So they're worked all year round, all the time. All of, all of our equipment is. Mm. But we need the reliability of the equipment, especially in snow, in order to remove the snow from the streets. I will say on that, Bill, if you don't mind j yeah. jumping in. Uh, sure. So Randy presented last night to the Capital Outlay Committee uh, his capital needs. They're significant. Um, there's a lot there, but there's a lot of needs there. And like you said, you know, last year we, we had the ability to focus a lot on the fire department's extensive needs. Uh, in prior years, we've done some of the other departments, but um, the DPW has, um, has been uh, left behind. I think I've said in, in the past, one of the things that keeps me up at night is Randy's deferment list. Yeah. Um, it just gets so long, and we depend so much on this equipment, and it's, so much of it is well beyond its useful life. And um, so thank you for your support for this because his, his capital needs are significant and important. I probably have 25 pieces of equipment that have been deferred, and I mean deferred like years. So this, it's, quite a, yeah. it's quite a list. It's t time to address some of those needs, I think. Yes. So. Um, so, you know, being in this position, every time we get a snowstorm, I get very nervous because I know that <laughs> our, our snow removal budget is, is, is one of the things that you can't really – can't really control it's it's a significant cost to us can you give the residents an idea of when we get like a bad snowstorm one of those snowstorms when we're in all day and it snows for about six hours continuously what's the what's the average cost of something like that uh you're talking two hundred thousand dollars about two hundred thousand dollars for yeah. a snowstorm yeah that's what i thought yeah so Depending i'm gonna on the type of storm yeah so I'm going to keep praying for my winter um, like I've been doing <laughs> the last two years. So with that, thank you, Randy. Uh, Joe, any questions? Uh, so, thank you, Randy. I do have a, a couple questions. Um, first, you talked about the um, cars per week, that volume. Yes. Um, what about the actual volume of, of what is brought to the, to the transfer station? So you, you may have more cars bringing fewer items, or, <coughs> or, or are we seeing a real increase in, in the quantity We're, that's being delivered? In the last three years, we've seen a downtick in trash. Okay. Uh, we've seen a slight uptick in recycling. But it's all around 500, 5,300 5, ton. And that's what I'm budgeting for, is 5,300 ton. So it's... Yeah. it's that, that number seems like it's rel relatively consistent. And so... It has been. Yeah. Through the years, it, I have seen it as, as up as high as 8,000 ton or 9,000 ton. It's, it's down now. It's down. Right. So, yes. so the, the uptick that you were talking about really is not uh, an uptick in um, what I would call the uh, what's being dropped off. It's really just vehicle traffic. Yes. Um, and that, that has its own implications in terms of... Um, the environment, having more cars going, and I mean, but but in terms of the impact on the transfer station, it does not seem to be a real a real impact. Unless unless you're talking about traffic control, it would be traffic control. That would be about the yeah. only impact. Yeah. Okay. Um, and the system engineer position is that the ninety six thousand yes. dollars that we see added. Okay. Um, we have had. Um, I think each member of the select board has been contacted at some point about the moratorium on road openings and whether it can be lifted and why do we have it. So perhaps you could just address that briefly as to why we have it, why we need it, and why it should not be lifted. Sure. So um, any time, especially during the winter, and you open up a road, you decrease the lifespan of that road. And especially in the winter when you have the frost and the rain and the snow, and it's not patched correctly, then water will get underneath the road, and water is the worst enemy of a road, and it will start deteriorating the whole road. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> there has been a moratorium in place um, starting November 15th. We have allowed, in past years, allowed the gas company to do main work because we were going to repave that road, and 
part was that they were, they were giving us a significant amount of money to reconstruct that road. Uh, they are no longer doing that. Um, and I basically went out of my way this year to tell everybody that, and we've had meetings with utilities, that we were not going to open roads this year unnecessarily unless the selectmen right. forced me to. And you, and you have a published schedule that's out there in terms of which yes. roads? Yes. Um, the moratorium starts on November 15th and is alleviated on April 15th. Great. Um, and one final question um, related to recycling. It's not recycling, it's composting. Uh, mm -hmm. I know you've been contacted by residents about <clears throat> whether the town should be offering composting at the transfer station, some other location, or what we can be doing, uh, or whether or not that should be totally a private opportunity and not associated with, with the town. Do you have any thoughts on, on where we're going? So my thoughts is that I think composting is great, and we do as much of it as we can in-house. In other words, the, the, the grass, the leaves, all that, we compost. Um, and there's the, the transfer station is such a small footprint, footprint, especially for composting. To add something else would be very difficult to do. And not only that, when you introduce food waste, now you're introducing um, vermin and vermin control. And we do have a program to take care of that. Um, the budget is very small, but I would hate to control the vermin that would come about. Um, there's, a, there's, a, there's a number of reasons. Sure, but uh, am I correct that um, you, there was, I don't know if you still do it, but you could go down to, um, uh, DPW and actually buy uh, at, at a really reduced cost uh, a composting? Yes, yes, there's a DEP grant, okay. which we're a part of, and um, people would only have to pay $25 and we pay the rest. Um, I think that the price is what, around $60? Yeah, so we buy a pallet every time and um, the residents let us know and we reserve a spot for them reserve the compost bin and then they come in and pick it up great thank you and were you asking the gentleman in the um, very bright oh i'm uh, sorry that that's the assistant <laughs> this, I will, assistant I mean, matt cahill um i was going to compliment you on your um, <laughs> on your christmas <laughs> uh, that's it no other questions thank you All right, Liz, any questions um just quickly thank you randy um i definitely see the need for the assistant engineer in this position would report to jr position is that right? myself yes or yourself okay um and the capital needs i appreciate i know those are long overdue i'm assuming it's a prioritized or reprioritized list was presented to I capital do it every year okay perfect <laughs> um one question just to follow up on the recycling costs and the um, <clears throat> trash removal i noticed the trash removal services fee or expense actually went mm -hmm. up yes is that just related to the cost going up or the, the cost that we, we have a contract with CMAS for five years. It will be up in um, 2024, Tom. <laughs> um, it go, uh, will go up automatically 3% the next two years. Okay. Um, costs for C&D, construction and demolition, that has a company bought that New England Recycling Company it's called, um, I forget what it's called, but they went up from $85 a ton to $135 a ton plus fuel costs. So that has gone basically through the roof. Okay. So I tried to estimate what we're gonna um, have to dispose of and that's how I, I uh, came up with the budget. Okay, so would it help if we were recycling more? I know there's a cost associated with that as well, but. It, it always helps when you recycle more. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. It, it, uh, the markets have to change, and they, and they keep telling me they will. At some point they will, but it's, it's up to the market. 
right now it's easier it's cheaper to recycle even though I'm we're paying mm -hmm. um, but trash costs are going up okay all right thank you sure do any members of the public have any questions about the public works transfer station and sewer budget All right, Randy, thanks very much. Thank you. Good seeing Thank you. you. Thank you. Matt, thanks very much. Good thanks. seeing you. Thanks, Matt. Next item on the agenda is the town hall budget. We have Jeff Beasy here with us this evening. Jeff, good evening. Okay. Come on up. All right, so I'll present this budget with Jeff this evening, and he's joined by his colleague, Horatio Hemmings. Yes, Horatio, good evening. <laughs> I think, as you guys know, Jeff and his team of five people, three full-time and, full and two part-timers, take great care of the town hall facility, as well as several other town hall building or municipal buildings, including GR Hall, 308 Cushing Street, 8 Short Street, even the Memorial Bell Tower they were doing in work recently. Um, in this facility, this campus is 137,000 square feet. It was last renovated in 1997, 1998. As you all know, it was an old school before that. Um, this contains most of our town departments, including the police station, although that will be moving to the new public safety facility in the coming years. The senior center, the recreation department and facilities, the school administrative offices, and our regional 911 dispatch center that serves Hingham, Hull, Norwell, and Cohasset. Um, his team, I already went over that. So in FY24, their request is $312,737 for salaries and $339,800 for expenses. Thanks very much. All right. <laughs> um, so to Jeff and Horatio, just really appreciate your dedication to, to what you do. And, yep. um, you know, you just, you, you both are so popular in town hall and um, <laughs> really appreciate all the work you do. So thank you for that. Yep. Um, I don't have any questions, Liz. Do you have any questions about this budget item? I don't have any questions. Thank you. <laughs> Joe. Um, I have a question for Tom first, which is, is any part of the town hall budget allocated either to the schools or to the other um, areas that are being supported by this budget? Uh, the, the one part of the budget that is subsidized is by Shrek, the 911 dispatch center, right. so they do pay... Um, they pay rent to the, to, to, to the town, they subsidize part of the maintenance team, um, right. and they pay some of the utilities directly for their operations. But not the schools. Uh, not, not, okay, so not the schools, not the no. Ones. And also, you know, I should note that part of um, Horatio's job description is he is my arm wrestling partner. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, what's the record, Joe? Joe. Exactly. <laughs> Joe, what's your record? <laughs> We're not going there. We're not going there. <laughs> Uh, but no other questions, thank you. Do any members of the public have any questions about this agenda item? All right, seeing none. Jeff, Horatio. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much for all you guys do. Take care. Have a good night. Next item on the agenda is the information technology budget. We have Bill Hardigan with us, the director of our IT department. Bill, good evening. Good evening. Happy Tuesday. Happy Tuesday. your screen that makes it easier all right we're uh hey, if anything fails now it's going to be on you <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> the owls are working <laughs> we're good so yeah it's actually one thing i didn't add in here i should have updated this a little bit more but you know, a little bit of information um really hasn't changed a lot from uh, year to year until we build a new building or something but as far as what we provide services to you know 26 town departments uh boards committees um, you know, the Zoom that uh, we're all using uh, and whatnot across 16 physical locations. Um, cybersecurity defenses, which, you know, there's a lot, spam, web filters, um, so on and so forth, and always checking those logs and making sure we're good there. Uh, over 300 users, uh, 36 servers, a couple of storage networks, um, end devices, which are different from people. Sometimes you have some shared. Um, printers, security cameras, firewalls, access points, so on and so forth to make everything work and make everything happy. Um, we've got a couple of voice servers, voice switches, 750 telephones. 
throughout the town and school offices as well. Um, and that's a shared service, obviously, you know, town and school. Um, and we purchase it, maintain it, configure it, support it, uh, end of life, um, and upgrade it. Uh, all of that equipment. And obviously, we have the municipal websites. Uh, we've gone through some refreshes and going through some more. Um, you know, we've done the town. We're working on the library and the country club currently on a refresh on their design as well. And on the various social media accounts as well. So. Uh, you know, we've got an uh, extremely large team of three um, taking care of all of this. Uh, so we're, we're doing pretty good there. Um, next, next page. Um, this is uh, you know, the images of our, our renovated data center, which, you know, midway through there, there used to be a wall and the floors. And uh, um, the first cabinet is, is, a, is the first one that we actually got nice, neat, and organized. So we're still working our way through, cleaning everything up. and. Uh, we'll get it nice and neat, but some of the projects we've undertaken uh, over the last year, we've done a fiber loop, we're about 90% complete, it's actually terminated here in Town Hall. They've got to come back and label it um, so we know which connection goes where of the 192 strands of fiber that we're run. Um, once that's done, we can start lighting it up and using it. Um, so that's been a long time coming and, you know, really looking forward to, uh, to getting that complete. Uh, obviously, the renovation of the server room is complete and you know, I'm happy to say, other than one, one broken wire during the entire construction project, which we had a spare, we just replaced it. That was the only thing that was, you know, really tough time going through all that, trying to keep that live while they're in there cutting wires, cutting walls, unplugging things, putting stuff back in. Um, so the one broken wire is the only, only thing we had. Not a big deal. Um, very happy with that. We requested new switches. We ordered them back in March. Uh, the first phase, which are going to replace all the switches here in this building that are end of life. They're in. I think they're waiting for the last delivery of a couple of cables that interconnect them. And we'll start scheduling that in January to get those installed. We've also ordered phase two of that. So we've broken this into multiple phases. Phase one is the town hall complex. Phase two is the uh, remote buildings. And phase three, we return to the server room and we're going to kind of neaten things up and um, put, a, put a switch in each rack and uh, really kind of streamline the operations and then make it easier for us to find everything. And uh, last year we also implemented, I think it was about February, a uh, endpoint management system so we can inventory and update and manage all of the devices, all the desktops and laptops and servers so we can systematically pr push updates, confirm updates, patches, um, all the configuration changes as necessary um, to the devices without having to physically touch each one. We can schedule it and have it go out and do that uh, automatically. Um, so that's, you know, the cost of a system is, is like that is far less than a, a FTE, so the, they, they're worth their weight in gold having these systems uh, in place. So we'll pop into our budget. Um, we're looking for, you know, total salaries, uh, 409236 uh, we do get some reimbursement from the school and uh, Ware River uh, for a couple of positions, so that helps. There's some offset there. Um, and then expenses, $460,000, $165,000. Um, so part of that is we're adding a few services into technology that we're taking from um, the uh, town administrator's office budget. So telephone systems, uh, Verizon and uh, Granite and uh, there's 12 or 13 different carriers, I don't know. Uh, I haven't dug into this $80,000 line item uh, to see what it is, but we're, we're taking over the payment of that. So that's really just a, a sliding of money from one department to another. Uh, it's not a net add from last year. We just, we manage all the functional of that. So it kind of made sense for us to pay the bills as well. Um, and then also the copier leases. Um, again, we manage the relationship, manage the copiers uh, and everything, and uh, we sent the bill down the corner here to be paid, so we're just gonna keep the bill and pay it directly. So, you know, there's $100,000 ad from last year that really is to the overall budget, not necessarily in that ad, you know, town-wide budget. Mm -hmm. um, it certainly is to me. We did increase uh, service and support agreements by about 12%. Uh, that's reflective of Things that have been added, you know, I know last week um, the board approved the transfer of some money for a procurement system, OpenGov. So, you know, next year I'll have to pay the maintenance on that. So there's $26,000 I'll have to um, take in as well as and pay for that. 
Um, Permitized, we've got an upgrade coming for that. That you know, there's a little, some slight increases in the renewals of that. And obviously, there was a lot of stuff purchased. Uh, there's something happened around three years ago coming up, and you know <laughs> that uh, required a lot of purchases. And uh, where there was CARES Act funding for a lot of that stuff. And now we still have the equipment and the services, but now we have to pay for them. So uh, that's you know where we came up with the 12% um, increase. Is that there's some additional things coming due that we hadn't been having to pay for the last two years because of the grants or some of the things came with three years of service and now that three years is up and we have to keep maintaining it. So I'm happy to answer any questions you have on that. Great. Well, Bill, appreciate all you do and um, you did a great job with the, with, the, with the town hall upgrade on the IT front. In fact, you only had, only, only having one broken wire is pretty impressive, so thank you for that. A lot of sleepless nights and days and, uh, you know, long days here at 6.30 with the contractors and until they left just to make sure there was no problem. Uh, it went very it smoothly. It did. Yeah. Yeah. Where are we with the upgrade to GAR Hall? A lot of the veterans groups are asking me about that. Yep. Like I said, when they get the fire, yep. uh, when they get the fire terminated, it's all in here and get it labeled. We'll know what goes where of those 192 str strands. And once we know that, we can light some stuff out over to there. What, so what's, what's the timeline, projected timeline on that? What do you think? Uh, they were supposed to be here last yeah. week. They got called off or, you know, somebody had a fiber cut and they actually, the, the fiber guys had to go back there and do the splice. But uh, they should be back here. Probably going to lose next week with the holiday, but, you know, the week after. So I, I expect we'll, gonna, we'll be able to light it up by the end of January, start lighting Great. things up. That's fantastic. Great. Yeah. Joe, any questions? Um, yeah, I just want to confirm some numbers. Sure. Um, so you talked about the telephone, which mm -hmm. was a transfer over. Mm -hmm. From town hall, so the item in town hall was sixty nine thousand. It's now eighty thousand. So it's not quite a um, a slide. We've we've got uh, you know a sixteen percent increase in that. Is that on, on that one? We yeah. looked at the. There's several accounts that go into that that fund all different types of telephones, from the yep. cell phones to the desk phones. But we took the last group of bills that we got and multiplied that by twelve just to capture the cost that we're paying right now. Okay, I mean, because overall the IT budget is up over 25%, but a lot of that is, is because of the telephone. Right. Um, are you comfortable with the level of our cybersecurity? Um, do, do we have enough in the budget? Because that, we cannot afford to underspend on that. So exactly, sure that exactly. Uh, yeah, and that's something that, you know, I'm, I'm constantly looking at. I've, I've spoken to a few vendors about a... Um, uh, a SOC, a security operations center, where they basically 24-7 monitor certain points they put uh, uh, analyzing tools on your network and they watch these things and they, they provide additional services with that as well where they would do monitoring just on tr traditional uptime on some of the equipment as well. But um, looking at some of that and I'm, I'm hoping that we can get some of that uh, in place next year as well. So again, part of that 12% was to you know, in absorb some of those things as well, those services. And to what extent do we have redundancy so that something goes down, you've got a backup system that's mm -hmm. hopefully not been attacked, affected? That well, we can... yeah, we last year we installed a new uh, storage array um, with an active active cluster, one physically here, one over at fire headquarters. Yep. Um, within that storage array, it uh, is constantly taking snapshots and the um, time slices for those snapshots vary based on the sure. data set we have. Uh, like Munis will have a certain time slot. Other data doesn't change as much. We'll have a different uh, time slice. But those, those are encrypted uh, replications that we could easily fall back to within minutes um, within that. But then we also back up every night. We, we've got a full backup at night. We, that goes off site as well. Um, so we've got layers upon layers, which, are, which is very important um, for that. Great. Um, Thank you. I, you know, even the best, I don't know, you know, it really didn't affect us too much here, but Rackspace is a, is a very, very big player yes. um, in a lot of space, and their um, exchange environment was hit with a ransomware attack two weeks ago, taking a number of municipalities, uh, their email offline. It was isolated to their uh, exchange services, but, um, you know, it's just, you, you got to remain watchful. And what they do is they noticed the activity and just unplugged everything and uh, slowly worked at, at cleaning it up. So um, they took a very, very proactive approach to it, which is, which is good. And you know, that's, that's one of the advantages if we were to bring in a, a SOC type service here, they're watching it 24 seven. You know, I, 
I try to keep an eye on things, but you know, I do sleep once in a while. And uh, well, Tom uh, doesn't. So yeah. you can, yeah. <laughs> so I'll just forward the email. You don't to want him. me working on machines. <laughs> um, so that you know it would help me sleep better as well, having somebody's somebody else with eyes on it um, off hours. Great, thank you. Sure. Any questions? Um, I was going to ask about the telephone. So that moved from not the select board budget. Is it the town uh -huh. hall budget? Yeah. Okay. Um, the school reimbursement for IT, is that mm -hmm. just support for administration in school this building? School administration, yeah. Not and the actual schools. Right, not for the actual schools. And obviously the phone system is a shared service, so right. um, we manage the core of all that for them. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Um, all right. I think that's it. Thank you. Do any members of the public have any questions about the information technology budget? Seeing none. Bill, have a good evening. Great. Yeah, Thank you, you very you much. Thanks. The next item on the agenda is the library budget. We have Linda Harper here and David Meegan. Come on up. Good evening. Hi. Good to see you. David, how are you? Okay, thank you for having us tonight. Um, so we are here to present the fiscal 24 um, library budget. And we'll start just by talking a little bit about our mission and services. So this is a lot of what we do. And if you haven't been to the library, you might know that, uh, or you might not know, we are many things to many people. So we have uh, a number of different things we do. Um, I'll just kind of go over some of the things that are in our mission statement. So one of the most important things we do are providing physical and digital materials um, to our patrons. That's our books, that's our eBooks, that's our databases, that's the technology we loan. We basically loan a whole bunch of different resources for all kinds of different needs, whether it's recreational, educational, or informational. We also provide lifelong learning where we nurture personal growth and we try to encourage people in the community to always continue to learn and to give them a space to do so. We encourage early childhood literacy. Uh, we have a big focus on story times, getting you know, books in kids' hands and helping them to get off to the right start because as you all know, reading is critical to a child's education. We also provide a lot of informational, historical, cultural programs. Um, our programs are well attended and it gives people an opportunity to come and learn something new. Um, in their own community without having to go too far. We also provide service on equal terms to all individuals in, individuals in the community. Um, as you probably know, we help everyone from little babies to the oldest citizens in our, in our community. Um, we try to do everything we can to meet those needs across a lot of different um, needs, age, age ranges, and abilities. We also provide an open, accessible, and collaborative environment. We're very supportive of equity, diversity, and inclusion in all things we do, collections, programs, and just our physical spaces. Um, we're a community center. If you've ever come by and looked at our parking lot, you can see we are the place people go. Um, you have nothing to do, come to the library. If you have something to do, come to the library. Um, <laughs> We also offer a diverse collection of print, media, electronic materials because we are trying to meet everybody's needs, whether it's someone coming in to do research, someone wants to learn something new, someone wants to meet a friend, we basically do it all. So some of the things that we do are evident in the numbers that we have. Our statistics are quite amazing. We're a very busy library on the South Shore, um, one of the busiest actually. We, um, in fiscal 22, our patrons borrowed a total of 324,857 items. And these are from our physical and digital collections. That's um, quite a borrowing pattern. Out of those, about 193,000 were for books, over 7,000 magazines, 46,000 movies, music, audiobooks. We circulated 47,000 ebooks from our collection. So you don't have to go to Amazon and pay. You can get them free from the library. People are always surprised to hear that. The same with e-audiobooks. We had 22,000 people download audiobooks they can listen to. 
We also circulated almost 6,000 miscellaneous items. A lot of people are surprised to hear that the library loans more things than just movies and books. We loan puzzles, artwork, technology, household gadgets, electronic devices. You know, you need a mixing stand, we have one. You want a you know, a, a tablet for a computer, we have one. How about some uh, of those, what are those, virtual reality headsets? Um, we have some really amazing things that give people a chance to really explore new things that come out and really, you know, try something new and, and expand their horizons. Um, interestingly enough, I'm going to make a note on the eBooks, the OCLN network, the Old Colony Library Network of which we are a part, it's about 30 public libraries in the region, just about a week or so ago, we hit a one million mark for circulation for ebooks for the year. So among us 30 libraries, we just circulated about a million ebooks, just to give you a sense of how important the, the libraries are, even digitally. Um, some more metrics we have. Um, our programs. Our programs are very popular, you know, during COVID. We did a lot of online programming. We're returning to in-person programming. And out of um, the 392 programs that we offered last fiscal year, we had 4,500 people attend, which is quite amazing. Our library databases that you can use even at home, you can get on and get some really great information, or at the library, were used over 49,000 times. Library materials that we send from one library to the other, so if you want a book and we don't have it, we can get it from another library, vice versa. We loaned 45,000 books last fiscal year. It gets sent through a delivery service. You place a hold from home, and magically, within a couple days, it's right here at the doorstep for you to pick up. We also have over 9,000 registered borrowers who actively use their library card in Hingham, which is pretty amazing. Our population now is about 23, 24,000 or so, and 9,000 of them all have and use their library cards. So these are active users. People also come to the library to use the wireless internet, especially with so many people working from home and the dogs barking and the kids are yelling, you go to the library to work. Last year we had 39,000 connections to our wireless internet, people bringing their own devices and just hopping on the internet. The members of the public used the library meeting rooms last year 127 times. So that's, you know, I know you have public meetings here, but at the library we also have meetings people can book the spaces and uh, for various, various things. So some of the, our key initiatives, these were identified in the library's long range plan for fiscal 22 to 26. These are some of the things that the trustees and the library staff are really working on for the next five years. We put together a strategic plan to help you know, guide our actions um, during that time. Some of the things we identified were the improvement of fiscal spaces, the expansion of communication and marketing, growth as a community resource, the enhancement of our collections, and also the development of funding sources. And on the funding sources, one thing I'd like to mention is if you haven't seen the letter in your mailbox right now, we have our annual fundraising drive. Every year we ask um, residents and our patrons to contribute to our annual fundraiser. Um, that money goes to help buying more books and materials and to have programs at the library. So if you haven't contributed, we would always appreciate any donation that you could make. So I just wanted to throw that out there in case you forgot the letter. Um, staff and expenses, so now to the budget. So one of the things I wanna talk about, salaries and expenses. The salaries, we've, we've seen a, a quote that I, I love. It's one of my favorite. It's the most important resource that the library goes home at night. And it is absolutely true. I know it's true for all the town departments, but if it weren't for the staff we have at the library, we wouldn't be such an amazing library. The building's wonderful, the collections are wonderful, but it's the trustees, it's the staff, it's the people who make the building, and I think that's one of the reasons we have such a successful library. So now that I've launched into that, our budget. So our salaries for fiscal 24 are 1,806,243. That's for 12 full-time personnel and 23 part-time personnel. Our expenses are 418,147. And some of the major items in our expense column include our regular repair and maintenance costs, our utilities, our books and materials, and our OCLN network assessment. And that's the amount of money we pay to be part of the network of 30 libraries. So we have borrowing privileges and can use the other libraries. 
I also want to mention what you don't see here is that we do have an active board of trustees who also contribute to the, to the running of the library. The trustees also contribute last, this current year $215,568 towards the purchase of books and materials. So they, they do fund a large portion of our material budget. They also contribute $14,000 to programs at the library. So all the things that we offer at the library are funded by the, by the trustees. And one of the reasons we have this annual drive is to get the, the funds to be able to do these things, the books and the programming. Um, so I think that is the conclusion of my presentation. Do I have any questions? And might I say, does David have anything he'd like to add? Do you want to say a word about home delivery? Yes, I do. Because so, <laughs> many people don't know about that and would be interested, I would think. Yes, yeah, so, you know, I could, sometime I'll have a, a chance to sit here and tell everyone about all the amazing things we do at the library, but I know you have a lot on the agenda tonight. But like I said, we're many things to many people. One of the things that we offer that I would like to mention to people is our home delivery service. So for residents who are homebound and cannot physically get to the library, we have a team of volunteers who are residents in the town who will pick out books, materials, other resources, and they'll actually bring it to the homebound person's house, <coughs> drop them off, and a couple weeks later, they'll pick them up and drop off another batch. So if you're interested in home delivery service, please call the main library and just ask, um, inquire about it and we can get you set up. We have volunteers just waiting to help people who need help. So it is an amazing service, one of the, one of the many things we do to reach the people who can't reach us. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for mentioning that. So uh, Linda and David, thank you very much. Um, you know, the library is such a tremendous part of the fabric of our community. And it's, you know, my entire life, it's always been like that. And it's just so great to see all the, all the, the program offerings and all, all that occurs at the library. Um, so many groups that I'm involved with, either scouts or other groups, use the rooms often, Linda, and that's very much appreciated by those organizations. So thank you for your leadership, Linda. And I'm enjoying my time, David, uh, on, as, a, as a liaison to the trustees. Huh. And um, the library trustees have tremendous passion for our library. And just, it's wonderful to see it. So I know you've been on the board for many years, David, and you, you're, you were so dedicated to the library and very much appreciate all you do as well. Thank you. So with that, I'm gonna turn to Liz, see if she has any questions. Yes, thank mm -hmm. you. I think it says a lot about our community, how treasured the library is, um, so thank you. Can you just explain a little bit about, um, I know there's a line item for books mm -hmm. and periodicals, but the um, the trustees also fund some of the book purchases, right? Is yes, it? yes they do. So the, um, if I can get down to that line, let me see. It is, bear with me. 116,000? Yeah, 116,000 yeah. So out of that amount, the, so there's a state aid compliance number. So the Mass Board of Library Commissioners um, which regulates all the mass libraries, has a formula that you have to meet in order to qualify for state aid. If you, and, and part of that is how much you, your municipal appropriation requirement, how much the town you know, appropriates. Mm -hmm. The other is a materials expenditure requirement, and that's, that's what this is. They have a formula um, based on your total municipal appropriation. They want to see increases every year. So you plug in the numbers to get this formula. If you qualify, you qualify for state aid, so you're able to get some money back into the town, which okay. I believe in fiscal 23 was about 46, I looked at the cherry sheet, I think it was about $46,000 or so. It also enables you to apply for different grants that they have, LSTA grants, things like that. So when you plug in all the numbers for our, our total municipal appropriation, we come out with this this number, and I'd have to get my calculator to add the 116 to the 215. So that's around 330 something, if my math is right. Um, so out of that, the trustees have contributed about 215,000 for the past number of years, um, five or ten years or so. I'd have to look okay. back on that. And as that number changes, we've put the difference, the delta, onto the town as the trustees are at their financial capacity limit, I think, of, of being able to contribute that amount. 
Um, so of that amount, that's a state aid requirement, and that's how we get that number. It's it's rather a non-negotiable number um, if we want to, you know, be certified sure, sure. and make our required numbers. Okay, great. Thank you for explaining that. Sure. No other questions. Joe. Sure. Um, a couple questions and a comment. I would start, Bill, by noting you're not just the lead years old. You're actually a trustee. Uh, <laughs> that's right. That's right. right. So, so, Only for the so did not point, I did not <laughs> point that out, but yes. That's right. That's right. Um, I'm wondering if you could comment about the volunteer opportunities ah. that are offered because um, people want to get involved and they, they really have a vested interest in the success of the library and volunteering is one way to do that. So if you could just comment on that. Absolutely. Th Please. Thank you for, I, I yes. love when we can pitch all these wonderful things. So the volunteers, one of the things you heard our volunteers do at the home delivery service, we have a number of just really wonderful, dedicated people in the community who volunteer their time. Um, some of the things they do are we have a, a bookstore at the library. We sell used books, library discarded books. If you donate books to the library that are, you know, we don't add to the collection. What we do is we have a bookstore, and all the money raised from selling the books in the bookstore go into the book buying budget to help us offset the cost of buying mm -hmm. materials. Um, that's all volunteer run 100%, um, our, as is our home delivery service. We have volunteers who come and shelve books in the children's department, adult department. Um, if we need books that have, you know, need mending, some of them come and do the, the fixing up. Um, we have um, other volunteers that come and they pull the hold. So when you're at home and you place a, a book on hold, there's a very good chance a volunteer will be in the next morning with a list and we'll go get that book ready for you to pick up. Um, so we have we have some amazing volunteer opportunities at the library. Can you so give the anyone, number, by the way? You know what the, the current number of volunteers how many is? Volunteers? Um, roughly. Yeah. roughly about 100. It dropped off yeah. a little after COVID, yeah. so it's probably around but 100 volunteers. Or so. <laughs> That's a big yeah. number. And yeah. we could not run the library without them. No, I, I believe they... And not only that, excuse me, yeah. not only that, but they love to be volunteers. They regard that as a service to them. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Because service at the library, volunteering at the library, especially for some of our senior volunteers who are probably the most productive of all, mm -hmm. it's an important thing for them to contribute. It's socially important. Mm -hmm. and um, yep. So it's a, it's a kind of a hard thing to quantify, but it's an extremely important function for them and for us. And, and as a person, as for as for actually doing volunteering, I was going to ask you. So if people wanted to do yes. that, who who did they call? How did um, they? If they call the main library, yeah. they can ask about volunteer opportunities. And Fickenworth will be the one to respond to their call, see what they're interested in, help them get set up. Um, two, two things I'd like to mention. One is that our volunteer, um, we also have a junior volunteer program for younger kids who are too young to start working, so they're not that you know, 14, 15 year old age range, but they want to actually start giving back to the community. We do have a junior volunteer program, and they shelve in the children's room, and we kind of get them used to what a work environment would be like on a volunteer basis, of course. And um, our volunteers are all in age range. You don't have to be retired. You can be young, middle-aged, old. Some people come after work. There's, there's all kinds of things you can do. Um, the other thing is we also have some volunteers who are in the tax write-off program. I know Michelle can probably give a little more information about that, but the town does offer um, a chance to, you know, help write off some of those costs associated with taxes, and some people do that by volunteering at the library. So um, that's definitely um, something else to consider as well. And you also mentioned um, donations. And so what are the opportunities and how do people go about making donations. Now, I'm not talking money. I'm talking about physical Book donations. books or whatever. Yes, okay. yes. We're, we're always looking for books in good condition, books, materials, things like that, even puzzles um, in, in you know, good, good condition. If you bring them to the library, just right to the main desk, um, we accept about a box of donations a day per person, just so you don't clean out your whole library at once um, for storage reasons. Um, and then, um, you know, if you want a receipt, we'll write your receipt for it, but that will go to the bookstore, and the bookstore volunteers will sort through those and figure out what they can sell. Um, interestingly enough, we oftentimes get donations that we choose not to sell for one reason or another. They may not quite meet our criteria, but if they're, um, if they're decent in decent condition, we actually, we then donate them to a, um, an organization called More Than, More Words. Than Words. Yeah. And David, do you know a little bit no, about No, a bit this? about More Than Words as an organization. My wife is very much involved with it, um, based in Boston and, and Waltham, which trains young people 
uh, in, uh, who are socially challenged and have been um, uh, various challenges to, to learn how to run a business and actually learn how to run a bookstore. And if you've ever been to their bookstore on Berkeley Street, that's another one in Waltham, uh, they do an incredible social good in helping young people in terms of their self-esteem and their ability to manage something. And uh, so, and they have relationships with libraries like ours. In fact, I think there's a more than words collecting bin at the dump, actually. They're, and, uh, but they come to the library and take books as well. They do, yes. Yeah. Um, I'm gonna turn to a different topic. Um, I believe it was either last year or the year before that the library did away with fines yes. for late books. And I'm wondering how that's going. Are you getting books returned? Was there a revenue hit? What, what are the implications of the, of um, the all of the done. above. We are getting books returned. Mm -hmm. um, people absolutely love it. I have only heard one complaint that, that we got rid of fines. Only one. Um, most people are thrilled not to have it. It is a bit of a, a, a deterrent to people who want to, you know, take things or they're afraid of, you know, getting it back on time. We want to get rid of that, that stigma and also just have people be able to borrow. So people are returning it on time. Most people are really good. Revenue hit, if somebody doesn't return an item within 60 days, they'll get billed the replacement cost, but that even that hasn't gone up past normal. So mm -hmm. it's really, I think it, it was an unfounded fear. People were afraid that oh, if we don't penalize people, they won't return them. They're gonna return them anyway. People are, most people are right. you know, honest and have good intentions. So um, that has not been a problem. The revenue hit, um, the, the fine money used to go into the trustee budget, so that is a revenue hit. That's one of the reasons that we're focusing um, so much on the, on the fundraising issue because um, it was a significant revenue loss for the trustees. Um, I know last year we had the Beyond the Books fundraiser, which was out on the front lawn of the library. We are planning another fundraiser tentatively scheduled for, is it April, April 28th, 20, yeah. 28th yeah. of this year? So. Mark your calendars next year. I, next year. So I said it first, so we claim the date, April 28th. It is the 28th, right? right? Um, we want to hold another fundraiser, and, and part of this is to make up for some of those lost revenues. The, it but, should be said that the fines were, had been dropping, the fine income had been mm -hmm. dropping for many, many years steadily because right. people didn't carry cash. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, so, it, right. you know, it's a loss. It's not the loss that it would have been if we'd done it many years before. Mm -hmm. And it's not only a trend, it's, it's really spreading. What, what, I mean, I believe last week, Situ had announced that they're going fine. Mm -hmm. um, and while that has declined, the bookstore income has increased. Libraries didn't used to have bookstores. Today, the library bookstore is the only independent bookstore in town. Mm -hmm. And they're good books at great prices, and it is a serious, significant revenue generator for the library. Mm -hmm. And okay. done by volunteers. Mm -hmm. When you talk about though the loss of revenue from the fines, that's a hit on the town though. It's not a hit to the trustees because to the extent the trustees don't have the funds from the books, you increase the amount that you're looking for from the town. Yes. So that decision had an impact on the financial contribution that the town was making. Mm -hmm. um, and so it, and I guess I'm a little concerned that that decision was made by the trustees without input from the town since it's a town hit. Mm -hmm. um, prior to the elimination of, of the, the fines, um, we had already frozen that $215,000 number. Um, part of that was because of declining revenues, because of online renewals. Um, you know, it used to be people couldn't renew, but now at midnight you think your items do, you can do that. There's also automatic renewals. Um, so we found across the board it had done that. So we had actually um, already set that 215 number and had you know talked to the town about that prior to this decision being made. So in that, it really didn't affect anything in past. And what we're trying to do is make up for the revenue on other sides. Um, so it, it, that 215 number was in place before we decided to eliminate fines for, for quite some time. I would also add that the money that we raise, every dollar that we raise, either through income on the invested funds or through fundraisers such as the annual appeal or the event that we're going to have next year, uh, every dollar that we raise is a dollar that does not come from the taxpayers. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, I think uh, historically the library has done well, trustees have done well. We need to do better, and we will do better. Um, the, the elimination of the fines, I don't... I don't remember the precise 
process of communication that took place uh, with the town. We were aware that it was a, it was a, uh, it was going to be a reduction in income, but it, it's been a national trend mm -hmm. and a regional trend mm -hmm. um, for reasons of fairness. And it's one of those things where you, th you know, we, you don't want to maintain a, uh, a, a source of income from the public a system of fines for the public just because of the income. You have, you know, just like you don't, you don't want to uh, maintain uh, excessive. Uh, uh, parking ticket fines or speeding ticket fines in order to raise money. Of course, we don't do that, but we sensible of the fact that we shouldn't be doing it at the library either. But as I say, I don't remember exactly who talked to whom at, at what point, mm -hmm. but I think we're going to make a uh, good faith effort and we will continue to make a good faith effort to, re to continue to raise funds. We, the trustees, we're all volunteers too, and we contribute as well. Mm -hmm. um, to uh, uh, replace any dollar that we lose, uh, that we have lost in that, in that, through that, that medium. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna finally ask about another national trend which is disturbing, which I have not seen in Hingham, which is a move for censorship at libraries. Um, and uh, I'm not aware of that happening here. I am aware of it happening in other communities and I'm just wondering have you seen it? Are you getting pressure either from parents uh, elsewhere to, to limit what is available to residents for, for some sort of censorship reason? That, that's a, thank you for bringing that up. It's a very good point. It is a, become a national yes. issue right now with a lot of libraries. Um, and there's a lot of unfortunate incidents over it, let's say, um, that librarians um, and their patrons are, are trying to sort out right now. Um, in Hingham, I think everyone has been, you know, more than civil. If people have questions about the collections, we talk about it. There's um, not really anything like you've seen on the national level. Um, there are always people who may have concerns about particular content, in which case we have a, you know, a, a, a way they can, you know, request a, a discussion about that. We can figure out what the issue is. Is something in the wrong placed in the wrong room, should it be age appropriate, mm -hmm. is it, you know, so um, I think people here are mostly fine for discussion. I have not seen any major things as some of our neighboring communities I know have experienced. Um, mm -hmm. David, do you have anything well, to add to that? As for policy, I mean, maybe you would say something about the, the, the ALA Bill of Rights that we, mm -hmm. uh, that we follow. Yes. We have, we have very, we of the trustees have a very clear policy in ensuring the, the uh, full accessibility of our collections and our services to all citizens. Mm -hmm. And I think we would push back very hard in any attempt to restrict uh, materials uh, or, or library uses from anyone. And that has never happened. We've never, I don't think we've ever had pickets. Uh, yeah. We've never had anyone demanding that we remove certain books. If they were to do that, we wouldn't do it. Uh, we can't do it. I mean, our policies are uh, predicated on openness and accessibility to all, all members of the community. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know we're very proud of that. And our staff, mm -hmm. <clears throat> our Linda and her staff, they are really, in, this is in their genes. It's really in their makeup. We do this for everybody. Everything we do is for everybody. And um, we're not in the business of banning certain types of books, certain subjects, uh, or certain authors. I'm sure there's probably a copy of Mein Kampf somewhere in the library. I don't know that there is. <laughs> But if I wanted to read it, I'd go to the library to get it. So yeah. uh, um, that's something that we all count on. We all uh, depend on our trustees and our and our staff members to protect those those mm -hmm. uh, those interests. So if that were to happen, the word, you know you'd hear from us. Yeah, <laughs> a, a librarian's job is is not to decide what people should have. It's to help them get it and just make sure it's from validated, vetted sources that are reliable. Um, beyond that, it, it's you know up to the individual to figure out what they need for their research or whatever they're doing that they would need particular resources. But we are all for equity in diversity and inclusion um, in all that we do. Uh, you know, having people go to the library to get access to information is why libraries exist. And Great. that's what we do. Thank you. Thank you for asking. Do any members of the public have any questions about the library budget? 
right, seeing none. Linda, okay. David, right. thank you. Good so to much. see you. Have a great evening. Thank you. Take care. All right, the next item on the agenda is the building budget. We have Mike Clancy with us this evening. Mike, come on up. Good to see you, Mike. Good evening. How are you? Good, thank you. Thank you for letting me uh, give you my budget presentation for the building department for FY24. I think I've explained this to the selectmen before, but I think I'll go through it again. Uh, the mission and service uh, building department, inspectional services department, fall under the Massachusetts Department of Public Safety. We enforce a series of 14 international codes, including the state building code, residential, commercial, the fire code, existing building code, mechanical code, swimming pool, SPA code, energy conservation code, architectural access board for disabilities, zoning act, chapter 40A, zoning bylaw, general bylaw, plumbing and gas codes, and electrical codes. Building officials are on duty 24-7. Um, uh, benchmark, uh, permit fees collected in 2023 through November was $1,269,550. Um, that included uh, building, sheet metal, certificate of uh, inspections, final cost after David's, certificate of use and occupancies. That was $1,134,467. Uh, electrical, plumbing, and gas was $135,083. Total permits to date issued were 3,025. Uh, total inspections to date, building, sheet metal, electrical, plumbing, gas, zoning complaints were 5,092. And that's down about um, 72 inspections or 1.51% or from last year at this time. Um, the key incentives, uh, building projects under construction and nearing completion. The Amazon Distribution Center at 100 Industrial Park Road received a certificate of use and occupancy. Derby Street shops continue to renovate existing spaces and adding uh, new businesses, including the uh, Shake Shack Untold Breweries. Planet Fitness received a certificate of use and occupancy after their renovations. The Hingham Shipyard continues to renovate existing spaces as well as adding the Birth Restaurant. 105 uh, North Street has received a building permit for new residential and commercial building well underway. Several more homes throughout the town have been demolished and um, rebuilt over the past year. Um, staff and expenses. Uh, the salaries are 273,942 dollars. Um, we have six full-time personnel, one building commissioner, two administrative assistants, one building, three building officials, six part-time officials. Uh, the expenses of uh, this year are 14,910. Um, that, that did go down 1,050 dollars after talking with Tom and um, on different issues as far as um, the major items. We did reduce the in-state travel from 5,000 to three. Uh, inspections, um, as far as vehicle um, fuel is still uh, 2,678. Um, the code books for 2,500, uh, we are anticipating in June we'll have new uh, code books for all electrical, plumbing, gas, and building. Um, also, the building revolving fund is credited with uh, plumbing, gas, electrical fees, and is used to pay the inspectors. So are there any questions I can answer for you? Well, Mike, thank you for all you do. You do a wonderful job with the building thank department. You. 
appreciate your hard work. We have a, a great team down there. Um, so uh, it sounds like we're seeing an uptick, an uptick in, uh, in construction, building, um, now that kind of come out of the pandemic here. Um, I know that's a good source of revenue for the, for the town, but mm -hmm. what are you seeing as a trend? From it the is, um, we usually um, issue around uh, 12 to 1,300 building permits a year. Mm -hmm. I think we're, we're going to be pretty close to that again this year. We're um, approaching um, 1,200 right now. I think there's about 30 in queue right now. So we'll probably be around, you know, uh, about 1,250 or so, I think, this year. So we might be off a little bit, but it's pretty close so, for over the past few years. Um, but again, people, um, it's a desirable town to come in. Um, the average addition or a single family home costs three, $300 a square foot to build. Um, and it's, um, it, it's just the trend that it is now. They are having some issues with um, uh, getting help and also getting their materials and things. It's still a struggle to get that, but uh, they seem to be um, dealing with it, the contractors and things, and the homeowners sometimes are getting a little frustrated with their contractors and things like that, but um, it, it seems to be okay. It seems to be working out. Joe, any questions? Um, just, just one, but Mike, thank you for everything you do. It's, it's so important to the town. It's, it's um, not just me, it's my team. It's your, it's, it's your team, uh, absolutely. Um, so the permit fees are a significant source of, of revenue. Um, do you know how our fee levels compare to neighboring towns? Are, are, are we in the same ballpark, higher, lower? I, I just don't have a sense of that. Well, uh, with Tom, and we have discussed this, and um, we went through that, and I, I did give a, um, some inf information on that. We're about in the middle right now. Um, we haven't uh, really adjusted the fees since 2009. Mm -hmm. And um, again, we're, mm -hmm. we're right in the middle. I believe we should, um, to be competitive with the rest of the towns around, um, they should be raised a little bit. Are the fees based on um, like a percentage of a project or, of a, or is it basically you know, so many dollars for a, this type of work? Correct. As it is right now, it's $10 per thousand of the value of construction for residential right. and $15 a thousand for, for commercial. So as the, as the cost, as value goes up, our fees go up? Correct. So we already have, a, in many ways, a self-adjusting increase because it's based on as a dollars per value, and so you know, as inflation carries those values up, uh, the amount we collect would go up. It's true, but we've also um, the average back in 2009, the average home, as far as inspections, had around 12. With the new codes and things that are out now, we're doing about 20 inspections yep. per house so again it, it's more uh, staff going out uh, some of the fees we have a uh, $35 for a, uh, an occupancy permit it costs the town $60 to send a, an inspector out there so we're you know kind of losing money on that um, where I would say Hull adjusted their prices um, last about a year ago, and we're about uh, about five dollars difference for the commercial and residential, as far as that. But again, we're right in the middle right now. But um, again, they it, it, the fees should be looked at definitely to be competitive and um, also to pay for you know the uh, sure. staffing and expenses. Yeah, just, just to jump in, like Mike said, we've been working on. The concept of an article to review the building fees, the building department fees, as well as potentially other fees in town, um, which is a heavier lift legally. So I think we're going to focus on the building department this year. We'll be talking to you folks here in the next um, few days and weeks. Um, I think that, you know, one of the things like Mike is pointing out is, yeah, we want to be competitive 
with our neighboring towns, but we also want to make sure that we're at least covering our costs. So there has to be a baseline, and right now we're not meeting that. So there needs to be a review, um, an, an adjustment, but, but we're in the middle of that review to determine what that adjustment really needs to look like. But more to come here in the you know, January 3rd, sure. January 10th, January 17th. So Liz, when, did your group look at uh, building fees when you were looking? We did, okay. actually, um, and that was one of the recommendations to look at the building department fees as well as the fees across the town and really think about and analyze if there should be a global structure um, and how that would be communicated if it would all be on the website as an example so people know. Um, but I think at a minimum, you want the you know building revolving fund to be kind of self-sufficient, right? So the permit right. fees are supporting what's sure. going out, mm -hmm. right? Paying the inspectors, right. the um, vehicles, uniforms, et cetera. So certainly something that yes, the Sustainable Budget Task Force yeah. has been looking at. Um, and one other question, Mike. How are you doing in terms of um, people appealing your decisions to the zoning board? Have, have um, any of that this year? Boy, I don't believe so. That's great. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it, it, that's because no you don't have Bob Devin who's yeah. going <laughs> after you. <laughs> you know, I'll give him any ideas. <laughs> it, it being a. <laughs> Being an enforcement department, there's really no easy way of telling somebody no, but if you sit down and you explain it to them, they usually um, come around and they, they're usually uh, okay with it, you know. Great. They, sometimes they're not happy with it, but, you know, it is what it is, and even, you know, Hames zoning is much, much better than most of the towns around. Mm -hmm. Much, much better. Thank you. So can I comment on that? Just I'll be very brief. Uh, so one one of the reasons that people accept Mike's expect explanations the way they do um, is because he's fair. He's a very fair person. He's a naturally good-hearted, fair, honest person, and that comes across when you're being told no and you're getting an explanation. Um, I think that that's a big part of the reason why the town doesn't um, suffer some of those problems that other towns do. So uh, thank you, Mike, for your help yeah. there. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Liz? No other questions. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, any members of the public have any questions about the building department budget? Mike, thanks very much. Have a great Thank evening. You. Yeah, take care. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks for your hard work. Good holiday. Happy Appreciate holiday. it. All right, next item on the agenda is the South Shore Country Club budget. I see we have Kevin Whaling, uh, Kevin Whalen attending by Zoom. Kevin, good evening. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for having me this evening. Um, the FY24 uh, budget for South Shore Country Club, we have uh, you know, a lot of things happening from a capital, uh, improving capital investment standpoint is concerned. And um, you know, along with um, you know, bringing on Brian, the new maintenance building, and then looking at um, our facility assessment. So as we go into the, the next slide there, our, you can see, you know, as we all know, we have a great 18 hole course, the driving range, PGA tour, golf facility, pro shop, youth programs, bowling alley, dining area, function space, and professional lessons. And you know, one of the things I think, you know, the driving range, we're putting investments in that as well in this year's budget by increasing, um, by buying new equipment over there to make sure that that is uh, something that is available for not only our current holders, but also our guests to drive some revenue. That has really not been something that we've gotten a lot of revenue out of, so we want to try to improve that. Um, you know, the golf simulators and the bowling should be back up online this year for the first time, and we're really kind of getting back and seeing the revenue numbers that we saw prior to the pandemic. Um, you know, as we want to provide a superior recreational experience for all social country club guests through high quality facilities, programs, professional instruction, and exceptional customer service. Um, we have a great partnership with the recreation department, Mark and uh, Mike and I. We uh, offer summer programs, but we also offer um, programs throughout the year to, for uh, learn to golf for the for children and adults, and that has really driven a lot of revenue in our, on our um, you know on our lesson side of the business. So we've done a great job as far as maximizing the amount of money that we can produce uh, from the lessons that we give not only to the kids in town but also adults in town. Uh, work with South Shore Country Club Management Committee and Friends of South Shore to develop long range plans to enhance the infrastructure. Um, and amenities that we offer here at South Shore Country Club. One of the things that we've been doing, um, I think you all know that we've done a facility assessment um, to kind of give us a pathway forward to uh, keeping, getting the buildings up to 
uh, where they need to be. As you all know, there's, been, there's, a, there's a lot of deferred maintenance issues that need to be addressed. Um, this step of getting a facility assessment will help us uh, develop the long range plan and also help us as we develop the uh, master plan for the country club. Of course, we have a, you know, a great partner in the Greenside Grill that provides full service restaurant catering services and in an event venue. So it's a, a great partnership between us and Raphael's that make that happen. So Ari, if you go to the next slide. We, one of the things I think, you know, the golf course is about 85% of our revenues. Um, we are kind of pretty much maxed out on the number of rounds that we can do in a year. One of the things that we are doing this year is that we have gone up 10% on our rates. We have about 400 people on our wait list to become permit holders. Um, and so we've gone up on not only the daily use fees, but also the, um, the permits. And the reason for that is we get into our budget, um, we look at, um, we have a maintenance building debt service coming online next fiscal year. And what that means is that obviously we're gonna have to you know, pay for that, you know, the building over the next 20 years. And so we want to make sure that we still maintain profitability as we go forward, even with that coming online and that debt service coming online. But I think you know, the golf course obviously is in great shape, but you know, have to really credit uh, Jake Silver, our assistant superintendent, and his staff that worked very hard um, to you know, make that happen. And the course is uh, you know, considered a, a, you know, a championship course, and it's always in, you know, we have a high level expectation of what we want to keep the course at, and Jake is able to maintain that to uh, satisfy all our guests. Um, to go to the next slide, you know, we've done a facility assessment, it's in draft form now, so that will provide us not only um, one year, three year, five year, kind of 10 year things that need to get done, um, but also it will allow us to, um, you know, kind of take a look at, you know, where they are and as we, you know, also plan for the master, you know, the master plan for the facility which will, should be done probably sometime in March that we should have that done. Um, you know, and also have costs um, assigned to all the different items that need to get done. These next two items in our key initiatives are things that were highlighted in the facility assessment. Um, and it's the roof replacement of the bowling alley, um, where the locker rooms are, and then also the original clubhouse where the function space is. So that is a project that's gonna cost about $230,000. And that is, uh, you know, something that really needs to uh, get done. The roof is all that is not that old, but because of the high winds and what have you, it's uh, it's really aged, um, you know, faster. And um, I just uh, at this point, you know, it's uh, I think we're pretty much running out of flex seal, being able to keep it all dry in the building. So we really need to, you know, look at replacing that for the next year. And then the next item is the replacement of the HVAC system in the main clubhouse, the locker rooms. Um, the main lobby area when you come in off the golf course, that area needs a new HVAC system. That's been estimated to cost $170,000. So we want, what we want to do is we're really trying to make sure that we either take it out of budget um, on, on these items that we have, or that we look at, um, you know, we don't want to add any more long-term debt. So one of the things we would look at doing is transferring $400,000 from our reserve fund or our fund balance, which we have about 800,000 in this year. And what that would do is we would take that money so we wouldn't incur that long-term debt to put, make these long-term investments into the building and infrastructure um, to you know, make sure that at least the envelopes of the building and the systems are working properly. You know, we also obviously have the pool and we're monitoring the status of that and hopefully we'll be able to, when things get resolved, we'll be able to move forward with that. The, other item that we're working with our partners at Hingham Light is, and this is something that the maintenance building was designed to be able to carry a solar array, um, and it would produce about ten thousand dollars worth of electricity annually. So we're working with them to, um, you see, if, how we're going to move forward to make that project happen. And I think you know we'll have continuing conversations. So how the project is funded, and you know who owns it, and what it looks like might change from now to when the final. Um, articles are needed, but you know we really want to kind of get moving forward because the building is really a perfect location uh, from it, the sight lines to you know southern exposure, um, the degree of the roof, and also you know the, the infrastructure is all built and it's new, so it's really ready to go. So we want to try to uh, move that project forward and fast track that ahead of probably other uh, you know energy projects that the town has going on. 
The new rough mower is an $80,000 item. That item is something that we would take out of our budget, and that's one of our line items for equipment. And that is something that we just need. Those machines last about 12 years, and it's the ones that we have are definitely at the end of their uh, service life. So we need to move forward with uh, getting another new rough mower. Um, the final item here on the fleet of 64 golf carts. We, our golf carts are about to be seven years old after um, this next season. And so what we're proposing to do is to lease for two years 64 golf carts um, in April of fiscal year 24. So that'd be a year from uh, next April. And what that will allow us to do the two year lease because we're gonna be moving into the new maintenance barn, that will allow us to house the cart where the equipment is stored now, but that's only about half the car. So what we're hoping to do is be able to kind of begin to plan for a transition from our, you know, gas carts to electric carts. Um, so we, we really might need that two years to kind of plan um, and build out the infrastructure to be able to take on um, electric carts. So what we would do is lease these carts for two years and then move to the transition to um, you know, purchasing the electric carts at that point in time and be able to house them um, in the car ground that we currently have and actually try to create some additional space for additional cars as well. So that's kind of the plan, and so that would also be coming out of our budget, and that's a line item that is on budget. It's $35,000 for this fiscal year, uh, the 24, and then it would have to be about $70,000 for the fiscal year after that because it would be double than that. Um, you know, because you'd also be next, the first year of FY24, it's only three month period, and then in FY25, it would be a full, a full season. So we'd have to double that line item. You know, when I've talked about the increased revenues, we anticipate almost about, uh, you know, it's 2.3 uh, million, 702, 2,373,000 of revenue in uh, FY24. This is with increases in our rates. Also, I think everything being back online as far as the bowling alley and simulators, uh, lessons continue to improve and as well as the driving range. So we feel very confident that, um, you know, the, the revenues will increase probably by about 10% in FY24 with the increase that we have. And we still anticipate that we will have a profit to be able to add to the fund balance in this fiscal year as well. So we'll add to that approximately the $800,000 that we have in fund balance. All right, if you can go to the next. So we have about nine full-time personnel, 30 part-time seasonal, that's the starters, the you know, ground screw, all of that. Um, and our expenses for the year on the, on the seasonal side is about 293,000 and then about $752,000 is for our full-time employees. We have a total of $1,045,198 for our payroll in this budget. Again, it goes over some of the major expenses that we have. The 35,000 for the golf cart, at least 167,000 is just for golf course applications. That's for seed, uh, fertilizer, um, all those different items that the herbicide things that we need to do to make sure that the course is in good condition. And then additional, the, the big bump in our budget this year is the $265,000 that we have for debt service on the maintenance building that we will be carrying uh, you know, for the foreseeable future. And then also utility costs and fuel costs. Fuel costs are up significantly as they are for everyone as, as our utility costs. So between all those items and then $80,000 the purchase of a new rough mover. And those are all items that are actually in our, um, in our budget, in our operating budget. Thank you. I think that's it. Kevin, thank you very much. Liz, any questions? Um, yeah, just a couple. Hi, Kevin. Thank you. Um, you do an amazing job at the Country Club in managing this enterprise fund. But just curious, um, I see a reduction in the seasonal personnel. What's, what's the rationale for that? The overall, I think we, we have gone up a little bit. So one of the things that the, the um, if you look at the overall budget for the payroll, there's some ups and downs. We have eliminated the, the bowling alley full-time position, and we have increased some of our line items, not significantly, but we have increased some of the seasonal line items by 10 to 15,000 for the pro shop and for the, um, for the maintenance staff, but we have decreased the bowling alley um, line item for payroll. So 
So overall, I think you know our, our payroll is just going up pretty much with the um, with the seasonal inc or the annual increases that the uh, personnel board will provide to my staff. Okay. And then you know we have increased up a little bit just for for staffing for um, for raises for the seasonal three percent for the. Uh, raises for the seasonal as well. The only thing that did decline would be like the bowling alley line item did decline a little bit. Okay. If I could just add to that, Kevin, I think this is also a little bit of a munis switch where um, on the very first sheet, if you're looking at this, we we bumped or pulled out the second assistant golf course right. superintendents because oh, yeah. they were included as seasonal, but they should have been permanent. Okay. So That's right. part okay. of it is so, just so the 127 is, yeah. was pulled yeah. down. Okay. Okay. Right. Okay. Thank you. I'm sorry about that. Yeah. No, that's okay. Thank you for clarifying. Um, and just a question about the restaurant. Um, remind me about that agreement and how that that offsets the costs or the expenses here so, at the eighty nine thousand. Yes. Yeah, so the, the restaurant pays us uh, for the lease eight thousand dollars per month. I believe that will it. Um, we are in our fourth year of a, a five-year extension. There's one five-year extension that's still available for the restaurant. Um, so they're in the process of that they pay, like I said, eight thousand dollars a month, so it's ninety-six thousand dollars a fiscal year. Mm -hmm. And then what we do is we have the line item in there for the restaurant, and they and that is for all the billing. So we what we do is in per the agreement, we pay all the um, utilities for the uh, for the restaurant and for the function spaces and then we build them back on a monthly basis so it's kind of that line item on the restaurant is really kind of a, a wash in the end we count it as revenue um, as it comes in from the restaurant but it's really we also have already incurred the expenses for those for the uh, you know for the you know gas for the electricity and all that because we pay that for the lease and then they they reimburse us back got it okay thank you no other questions Joe Kevin, uh, thank you for the presentation. Um, I assumed you had to participate by Zoom because you're at the golf course. Someplace. <laughs> I know it's a little yeah. chilly, but uh, um, so your your total 6601 costs are up 22 percent, um, and I, as you said, most of it is attributed to the debt service, uh, both principal and interest. Um, but with that increase, you're, you're still within your your budget for an enterprise fund? Yes, absolutely. And I think, you know, as, as I've always said, I think, you know, one of the things I think we've done a good job in the last, you know, four years is we really manage, um, you know, I definitely manage our expenses to what our revenues are to ensure that we do have um, a profitability and maintain our margins. And, you know, we've been pretty good at that the last several years and we'll continue to do that to ensure that, uh, you know, we're not getting, uh, you know, that, that we're, self-sufficient yep uh, well I got no other questions I really think uh, outstanding job to you and your team thank you thank you appreciate it are there any questions from the public about the South Shore Country Club budget if I, yep go ahead you want to add something else yeah I just wanted to also you know I'd be remiss if I didn't um, thank you know Chris Riley and Mike Libby Chris Riley is the golf professional at the Country Club they both do a great job of managing you know, the day-to-day -day in the pro shop, and I really appreciate all their efforts, and as well as the uh, Country Club Management Committee for their guidance as well. Kevin, thank you. Thanks. And thank not, you. Not, not seeing any questions, we will move to the next budget item. Kevin, have a good night. Thank you. You too, thank you. Next item on the agenda is the Shrek budget. Tom, you gonna take us through this? Sure, this will be a brief one. So uh, this is the regional 911 dispatch services, um, the South Shore Regional Emergency Communication Center otherwise known as Shrek. Um, so they sit here at 210 Central Street in Hingham at Town Hall. They serve uh, Norwell, Hull, Cohasset, and Hingham. Uh, those are the four towns that are served by the, by the Shrek. Um, it's a budget um, to Hingham of approximately $1,040,000 is our, um, our assessment. It's based on call, a combination of call volume and um, and population so uh, so that's the way that's calculated but our hit is about a million dollars they do a lot of great work they're they're the first think of the, the 911 center as the first point of contact for all the emergencies in town um, these folks do uh, they're they're there 24 7 and they do terrific work um, so they're run nowadays by their executive director is Aaron Smith um, he's been in that role now for almost going on two years 
uh, and he's done. He's been doing a fantastic job. They receive about twenty-eight thousand calls a year. Um, they're a twenty-four-seven operation, like I said. Um, anyway, I think I think that's the. It's an annual uh, increase at the budgeting time of about five percent. Their uh, their budgeting effort will in uh, in in earnest will begin starting in January. So about a month from now is when we'll get our first preliminary budget from them. So what we do every year is we anticipate a 5% increase. Um, I've been told that the 5% will be more than enough for any increases that come through the budget process. So it won't be more than this. It will likely be something less. If we can perfect it at the end of the year, if we know enough, we will. Otherwise, it ends up as a turn back. Thank you, Tom. Joe, any questions? Tom, do you just want to comment briefly on the audit situation with uh, Track? Sure. Yeah, thank you. So our audit committee here in Hingham had been, uh, had been suggesting for many years that, uh, that the Shrek needed to do its own audit. Um, it hadn't done one since its inception. It needed to. Uh, and the, myself and the other directors, uh, the town managers of each town are together, the board of directors for the Shrek. Um, have agreed to that, funded it in last year's budget, and it's currently uh, underway. Well, it will be underway beginning of January 1st. Great. Thank you. No other questions. Liz, any questions? Can you just remind me, Tom, is, is our, what we pay, is it based literally on the number of calls, or does Hingham have a percentage share? It's a, it's a combination formula of the number of, co number of calls and population. I don't forget okay. the exact formula, but it's a combination of both. Okay. Okay. Yep. Thank you. Yep. We are by far the largest community, obviously. Yeah. Yeah. Any questions from the public about the Shrek budget? All right, seeing none. Um, I'm going to go back to item four on our agenda because I do see Ann Smith White has joined us. Um, item four is to consider approval of a special one day wine and malt beverages license to WM Brewing Company Incorporated for the New Year's bonfire to be held on Saturday, January 7th, 2023, with a rain date of Sunday, January 8th. 2023 from 5 p.m. to 8 p.m. And good evening. Good evening. Go ahead, tell us about your application. Um, so we are, this is our annual bonfire. We did it last year. We're looking forward to doing it again um, Saturday night after New Year's, um, 5 to 8 p.m. We're looking to sell about 300 tickets. We're hoping for nice cold weather, but not a ton of snow. <laughs> Um, we I talked with the um, fire chief. We're all set for um, to have a, a duty with two fire um, firefighters on hand. Um, we'll have a food truck, and um, Widowmaker will be in attendance as well here at the brewery. Excellent, um, Tom. It's the police chief, fire chief, have okayed this uh, application. Both chiefs are good with it. This is a repeat, um, a repeat program. Great. Yeah, and both chiefs are good with it. Liz, any questions? No questions or concerns. Thank you. Joe. No questions. Thank you. Any members of the public have any questions or comments about this agenda item? All right, with that, I would take a motion. I'll make a motion to approve the issuance of a special one-day wine and malt beverages license to WM Brewing Company Incorporated for the New Year's bonfire to be held on Saturday, January 7, 2023, with a rain date of Sunday, January 8, 2023, from 5 p.m. to 8 p.m. Second. All those in favor, Liz? Aye. Joe? Aye. And I'm an eyes while the motion carries. And good luck for your event. Thank you very yes. much. Thank you. Happy holidays. Happy holidays. All right. Um, I, I, agenda item five, obviously the applicant is not with us this evening. Um, how do you, do you want to hold this over? Or do you want to proceed on it? Joe, what do you think? Tom, uh, is everything in order for this? Or? So everything is. It's a repeat event. Um, however, I did clear uh, with um, Sharon just before she left that this, uh, this event is technically after your next meeting, so you could take this up on the yeah. third if you wanted to, but she did say it's a repeat event and the chief is fine with it. So if you want to hear from the applicant, we can do it on the third. Liz, what do you think? I don't have any concerns. I, I know we reviewed it last year um, and uh, the police chief has signed off on it, correct? Yes. So. I'm fine with doing You're it okay tonight. Yep. It? Joe, what do you think? Yeah, I, I agree with Liz. Okay. Um, let, me, let me just read the agenda item into the record so it's clear. Um, agenda item five is to consider approval of a special one day wine and malt beverages license to Friends of Hingham Cemetery Incorporated for a night of music, 
with Chelsea Berry and Matt Cusson to be held at Ames Chapel on January 7th, 2023 from 7 p.m. to 10 p.m. Obviously, the board has no um, additional questions on this item. Do any members of the public have any questions on this agenda item? All right, if you're comfortable proceeding, then I would take yeah. a motion. And I do note that there is no rain date associated with this. Correct. Yep. So with that, I will uh, make a motion to issue, make sure I'm doing the right one, um, to approve the issuance of a special one-day malt wine and malt beverages license to Friends of Hingham Cemetery, Inc. for a night of music with Chelsea Berry and Matt Cousin to be held at Ames Chapel on Saturday, January 7, 2023, from 7 p.m. to 10 p.m. Second. All those in favor, Joe? Aye. Liz? Aye. And I'm an eye as well, the motion carries. The next item on the agenda is to consider approval of a donation of a certain property at 22 Abington to the Conservation Commission. We have uh, Lonnie Fournier with us. Good evening, Lonnie. Good evening. Hello. Thank you for patiently waiting in the audience. Of course. Yeah. And I'm going to magically transfer my GIS powers to art, I think. <laughs> put a map up on the screen. Um, and a thank you to Bob Devon as well, who's in the audience and representing the property owner here tonight. Um, so the quick rundown on 22 Abington Street is that we started talking about this donation back in 2020, believe it or not. Um, the parcel is largely undevelopable, uh, mostly because of the wetlands that you can potentially make out on screen. Um, they are configured in an inconvenient way for development, um, and the Conservation Commission has a, a protective 50-foot buffer zone around wetlands um, and largely likes to see that protected, uh, i.e. undeveloped, especially in cases where it is currently undeveloped. So they do make exceptions where um, there's already development in the 50-foot buffer. Uh, but in this case, um, it is in good condition for our purposes. <laughs> um, so approximately 40% of the lot is wet when you add the 50-foot buffer to that. It's, it totals 96% of the lot. There's also a certified vernal pool that is conveniently yet inconveniently located right near the front edge. The Conservation Commission has a 100-foot protective buffer around that as well. Um, Adjacent to the property, we have commercial and industrial uses to the south and west. Uh, there is vacant land that's zoned industrial park to the east, and some residential land across the street uh, to the north at Abington Street is the locus here. Um, this is towards the Rockland Street end, or the, sorry, Rockland end of Abington Street. Um, the Conservation Commission owns another property known as Old Swamp River Conservation Area. It's about a quarter of a mile towards the Weymouth end of Abington Street, so up the street as we're looking at the map. Um, the property owner uh, has owned this for several decades, uh, first via a trust and now is the sole property owner for it. Uh, over the years that has been recognized as undeveloped, he has tried to find a different or an interested owner. Uh, can someone else take it? I have no use for it. Um, so he's done some great due diligence there, making sure that there was no one else that's interested, and no one was. Uh, the Conservation Commission, with their protective wetlands um, mission and the, having the conservation property up the street, seemed like the best fit for this particular property. Um, and the owner also went above and beyond uh, in terms of our usual gift scenario and that they did the title research or they covered the title research themselves. Uh, and they also hired a professional to conduct the phase one environmental site assessment. Uh, that came back clean. The property has been undeveloped its entire life as far as we can tell uh, and no risk of contamination and those two items are of particular importance when it comes to considered gifts we want to make sure that the title is in order and that the site is clean uh, in terms of potential lost revenue generally the taxes on this property are about three thousand dollars a year um, and the assessed value for this fiscal year was just under three hundred thousand dollars um, the Open Space Acquisition Committee first vetted this gift. They are in favor of us accepting it, and the Conservation Commission is also in favor uh, due to the wildlife habitat, some water quality protection values, and its rechar recharge capacity. Um, 
this wetland complex is adjacent to um, Old Swamp River, which if I'm not mistaken, contributes to Weymouth water supply, sort of tangentially. So there is some benefits to our neighboring communities through accepting this and protecting it as well. I'm happy to answer any questions. Lonnie, thank you. I know that we have attorney Bob Devon with us tonight who represents the applicant. Bob, do you want to add anything to Lonnie's presentation? No. Uh, and if you do, just go up to the mic. If, if you don't, that's fine. But, it, but I know that, you know, you bill by the hour, so I figured you might. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I think Lonnie has summarized the, the thing very well. Okay. Thank you, Bob. Good to see you again. Yeah. Nice to see you. Um, so, uh, yeah, so, so the, the, the lost tax revenue would be about $3,000, is that correct? Okay, yes. but the assessed value is almost is 300 Yes. Um, but you can't, the land is undevelopable, correct? I mean, if, if they're within the, if you're, win, if you're within 100 feet of the wetland, they need a variance to build on that, right? And they 50 would need feet, a permit, yeah. And within 50, 50 feet, feet, you guys don't grant. Um, not on an undeveloped parcel like right. this. It would be a very difficult road ahead. Um, Emily Wentworth also contributed to some of the zoning analysis that was in your memo, and she came to the same conclusion that based on zoning, wetland, um, and some Board of Health regulations, there are some um, potable wells in the area where this part of town would be on septic and having the setbacks from those wells would make further development on this lot more challenging um it just seems like it's a really really tough road ahead okay especially for a commercial or industrial use which is what its zone does mm -hmm. joe do you have any questions um i do uh but first thanks for the work here this is very important you know, when I was on the Conservation Commission, we were getting donations of land on Main Street. And now you're, where, where are you there? Uh, I, don't, I don't know what's, what's going on here. Um, so um, other than the lost tax revenue, are there any costs to the town? For example, maintenance of the property, um, anything you can think of that there would be annual recurring costs to the town? I don't think so. I, I don't envision this becoming the next best sort of open space destination for residents or visitors. Um, at worst, we're looking at some roadside litter cleanup that can be accomplished at the same time that we're down at the Old Swamp River um, parcel. So no, I, I don't see improvements coming in here. I don't see, a, fingers crossed, a lot of, you know, vandalism or expansion or you know incredible use by the public it's it's very wet hard to traverse so i think in and of itself it will sort of um deter people from exploring um so no i i, I don't think it will cost much and, and that was really my next question which is to what extent is there public access to this parcel and would, would, is it likely to be utilized i'm hearing it's unlikely to be utilized but i think yeah. um parking and access are challenging. We face the same challenges with the Old Swamp River parcel right. in that um, you sort of, when I've gone to you know check on the property and do some litter pickup, uh, you park on the shoulder of Abington, which is narrow, um, and right. drivers on Abington Street tend to go at a pretty good clip, and so it's, it's not welcoming to be there. We do have a kiosk and a sign at the Old Swamp River parcel. Um, it's open to hunting as well. Uh, deer and turkey only uh, with a permit for anyone listening <laughs> with a permit from the office don't just head down there um, <laughs> so it, it's challenging it's in a fairly remote portion of town uh, yeah. that's mostly industrial parking is a challenge uh, and for this particular parcel I just don't see uh, a lot of people visiting it yeah. and you know the biggest concern from my perspective is we don't want to be taking ownership to a Superfund site but you've You've done We've that. We've made sure that's diligence. not the case. <laughs> okay, great. Uh, no, no other questions. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Liz, any questions? Um, can you just tell us what's number 28 on the map? Do you know what that? All right, would you mind clicking identify and seeing what the owner is? And I know you said that there was, it sounds like there was a fair amount of due diligence. I'm assuming, or contacting the abutters part of that process. In terms of whether or not they'd be interested in the acquisition, I believe the property owner did that okay. as sort of a, his due diligence to make sure that no one else was out there that wanted it. Um, but I think, Liz, that's, the answer to you, that's not very helpful. There, there's no requirement to that, that. butters be notified as, as you would in a permitting uh, process. Correct. Sure. So the the 
the act of the gift coming to us doesn't need a butter or doesn't require a butter, mm-hmm. a butter notification. Mm-hmm. But if I remember correctly from several years ago, there was the, the concerted effort to make sure that a butters weren't interested first, right? They would likely be the most interested. After that, I, I know for a fact that the land trust was contacted. Are you interested? They don't really have anything in the area, even remotely. Okay. Um, and so then next it came to us and said, would you be interested? Okay. Um, I'd like to know also on a positive note that the property owner has been paying his taxes all these years. Typically, property owners might get frustrated with the fact that they can't develop their land, and yet they're still being assessed taxes. Um, And so the property owner here has really been upstanding in the fact that he recognizes sort of the challenges ahead, but has stayed fair and on the books and upfront with us as part of the process. Mm -hmm. Um, And that has alleviated a lot of the complications that could have come with this gift. Great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And thank you for preparing this memo. It was very helpful Mm -hmm. um, to see not only the due diligence that you went through, um, but also the tax value. And and it's good to hear there's not ongoing maintenance as well. So I I do have one other question. Mm -hmm. Um, Assuming that the board does vote to accept this property, uh, would it be your practice to send uh, a note of thanks and acknowledgement to the owner um, so that we, this is not, uh, this is not a trivial event. I mean, uh, making a gift to the town is important and should should be acknowledged. I, I can absolutely do that. I think they will be thrilled after two years just to know that it's actually happening. <laughs> but yes, I'm, I'm happy to do that. Thank you. Correct me if I'm wrong, Mr. Devon. Thrilled. <laughs> 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 it's been a long road. If I may, Liz, I believe that's a landscaping business. Okay. Yeah, okay. Yeah. It's gonna, it's, I was, I was going to say it's probably a, st- a storage of some facility, mm-hmm. yeah, because it's up on Abington Street, um, and with the size of the building, it looks like it might be something of that nature. It seems like the access might also be off of Sharp, yeah, and not sad. Abington, yeah. and so it's mm-hmm. it would be tucked back quite a ways from both of those roads, mm-hmm. in case you're trying to place it in your mind. Actually, no, they come in off Abington. All right, any members of the public have any questions about this agenda item? All right, seeing none, I take a motion. I'll make a motion that the board approve the acceptance by the Conservation Commission pursuant to Master General Law Chapter 40, Section 8C of a deed of the property known as 22 Abington Street for conservation purposes. Second. All those in favor, Liz? Aye. Joe? Aye. Nam and I as well. The motion carries. Lonnie, thank you very much. Thank you. Bob thank you. Bob again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Care. All right, next item on the agenda is to consider approval of the 2023 Common uh, Victory License Renewals. Um, <coughs> any questions on this agenda item, Liz? No questions, thank you. Joe? I've reviewed the list, no questions. Any members of the public have any questions about this agenda item? And I'll take a motion. I move to approve the renewal of the Common Victory Licenses as presented for calendar year 2023. Second. All those in favor, Joe? Aye. Liz? Aye. And I'm an aye as well. The motion carries. Next item on the agenda is consider approval of the 2023 limousine license renewals. Joe, any questions about this agenda item? No. Liz? Nope. Any members of the public have any questions or comments? Seeing none, I take a motion. Make a motion to approve the renewal of the limousine license as presented for calendar year 2023. Second. All those in favor, Liz? Aye. Joe? Aye. And I'm an aye as well. The motion carries. Next item on the agenda is appointments. I don't believe we have any appointments this evening. Nope. Then we will go to public comment. Is there any public comment this evening? Seeing none, I turn to town administrator select board reports. Let's start with uh, Art this evening. Uh, Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I just want to uh, share this evening an update with regard to our sustainability coordinator. We actually have a new person on board, uh, Virginia LeClaire. Uh, She started uh, about two weeks ago now. She's making the rounds, getting acquainted with the different uh, boards, committees, and departments that have interests, needs, and aspirations with regard to sustainability. We'll be putting together a a plan together, and uh, she'll be uh, hard at work uh, in the near future. You know, one potential project that you heard uh, Kevin Whalen talk about tonight, the idea of getting a PV solar array on the maintenance building. A lot of folks are interested in getting something like that uh, moving forward, and she'll, she'll be working on that for us. 
Matter of fact, just piggyback on that. She's this is a fully grant funded position that is uh, par she's partially covering um, the town of Cohasset mm -hmm. as well as Hingham. Sure. So, and Art's been managing this That's whole great. effort. Well, great job, Art. It's good that yes. we got that um, got her on board, and now she's starting to work. That's great. Michelle, anything? Nothing this evening. Thank you. Uh, Tom. Not tonight. Thanks. All right. Um, go to Liz. Nothing to report. Joe. Uh, just briefly, on Sunday evening, there was a uh, Hanukkah event at the Hingham Shipyard, supported by the fire department, and then an hour later, there was another Hanukkah event at the synagogue up on Main Street, also supported by the fire department doing, uh, uh, throwing money, uh, not money, sorry, candy <laughs> from the tops of fire trucks to the kids below. Uh, it was really greatly appreciated. Um, so happy Hanukkah to everyone. Yes, happy Hanukkah. Happy Hanukkah. We have a menorah lighting <laughs> tomorrow. Tomorrow night. Yes. Night at five o'clock at uh, the Talbot Salon. Great. Oh, that's great. Yet another lighting. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, everybody. Well, this is going to be our last meeting for 2022. I just want to note this has been a um, very busy and uh, a tremendous year for the town. Obviously, uh, two of the the bigger highlights for. Um, the, the approval of the new foster school funding and the approval for the funding for a public safety building. But we also had a, you know, a wonderful town meeting in the spring. Um, and just a lot of great things happened this past year. So I'm very thankful for my colleagues, thankful for the staff, Tom, Art, Michelle as well. Um, 23 is not gonna slow down at all. We're gonna have a busy year in 23 and we'll have a lot of challenges facing us. We'll have a lot of difficult uh, decisions that we have a, as a community have to make regarding our budget and some other some other items but as we always do we'll get through them because we get through them together and after we debate items and we discuss them and we always seem to come to the right conclusion and hang them so looking forward to the year ahead i want to wish everybody happy holidays um and with that i would take a motion to adjourn i move we adjourn second all those in favor joe aye liz aye we are adjourned everybody happy holidays we'll see you in 23. thank Next you year. happy holidays